Could I have everybody's attention, please? And we will get started as, as soon as we can. Well, I want to welcome everybody here and thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here. It's very important that we have your input and uh, I'm very pleased with the number of people that are here today. In 1976, Minnesota's U.S. Senator Hubert H. Humphrey made this now memorable and off-quoted comment to an audience. He said, the moral test of a government is how it treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the aged, and those who are in the shadow of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Minnesota has long been a leader in services for people with disabilities, and it continues to look for opportunities to help people live with as independently as possible and to have as many choices about their lives as possible. Our draft plan carries on the work of past advocates, and it charts a course that ensures Minnesotans with disabilities have the opportunity to learn, work, and live and enjoy life in the most integrated setting desirable. On behalf of Governor Dayton and the entire Olmstead Plan subcabinet, I thank you for being here today and helping us shape a plan that will guide Minnesota's direction for years to come. The Olmstead Plan subcabinet is collaborating to improve the way state government provides supports and services for persons with disabilities. The plan also will improve the quality and independence of people's lives. Representative Murphy, come and join us up here. We are committed to ensuring that inclusive community-based services are available because we recognize that these services support freedom of choice and participation in community life. We aim for a plan that assures the state's program services and activities are provided in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the individuals with disabilities. This sub-cabinet was established by Governor Dayton to engage the state agencies most involved with service provision in a conversation with Minnesotans. And today I have with me the sub-cabinet and there are eight agencies represented on the sub-cabinet in addition to the executive office of the governor as well as um, two advocates for persons with disabilities. And, I, and in addition, we have some of your local representatives here. And what I'd like to do is to just go around the table and ask people to please introduce themselves and the agency that they represent. And I think I'll start with you. Good afternoon. Uh, I've got to put you on just a minute. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name's Robin Whitley. I come from the Department of Education. I'm really happy to be here. And I just wanted to let you know I'm going to have to step away every hour and 20 minutes to go and plug my meter for my <laughs> <laughs> so, um, It's not that I won't be coming back. You'll just see me coming and going. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm, okay, Cynthia, I'm sorry. Would you start again? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Bowerly. I'm with the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Jessen. I'm Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And I'd also just like to note we have several other uh, employees of the department here with us. I'm sure I will miss some people, but I know we have Assistant Commissioner Lauren Coleman who's here, our Chief Compliant Office, Compliance Officer Greg Gray, who is also with us here today. And I think I neglected to say that uh, I'm the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Minnesota, <laughs> Yvonne Pretner Solon, and I also chair the sub-cabinet of the Olmstead Plan Committee. I'm Judy Plant, assisting the Lieutenant Governor on this. I lost it. You want to take over, Beth? <laughs> you want me to go ahead? Yes, Can you please. I'm Roberta Opheim. I'm the State Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. And hopefully somewhere in the room is Michael Woods from the Office of Ombudsman who serves the northeastern part of the state. I'm Colleen Wick with the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. 
My name is Tom Roy. I'm Commissioner of Corrections. Representative Huntley. Uh, Representative Tom Huntley, District 7A, which is East Duluth, and I will say that Lieutenant Governor Solon and I are very used to this particular. <laughs> yes, we both served our time here. Representative Murphy. Um, I'm Representative Mary Murphy. I'm from District 3B, which includes Precinct uh, 11 and 23 in, in Duluth, and then all the area from Proctor, Hermantown, and up the shore to Two Harbors. And I'm on a meter also, and I have to leave at 2.05. <laughs> I, I also want you to know that uh, Dr. Ed Ellinger, who is the uh, commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health, is speaking at the nutrition uh, uh, conference that's being held at the deck right now, and he will be joining us as soon as he's finished speaking, which should be within the next half hour. I want to emphasize that this plan, the Olmstead plan, is only a draft. We are holding these listening sessions early in the process because we want your help in shaping this plan. And we need to know from you, what are you expecting in this plan? What are you hoping to see in this plan? What are your concerns and what are your suggestions? Our format for today is that there will be a presentation and, and an overview of the plan and then we'll have comments from you, up to three minutes per speaker. Some of you have already signed up and Rosalie, who's standing in the entrance in the back there, is still taking names for sign up, so if you would like to speak and address the committee, please sign up to do so. Materials that are available for today are a power plant, a, come on in, <laughs> a, a PowerPoint slide overview of the Olmstead plan process, a 16 page overview of Minnesota's draft Olmstead plan, and these documents are already available online. They're also here in print, and we have copies available in Braille for those who might need it. In addition, the full draft is available online. So your options for input are to sign up to speak before the subcabinet today, or to provide your comments in writing by mail here today or online. Our job today is to listen carefully and to be sure that we understand your suggestions and your concerns. I want you to know that we have been working very hard and we want to do the right thing and make the best plan possible. But sometimes we get locked into our own ideas and have difficulty seeing beyond them. So today we will be working very hard to listen with our, our ears and our minds open to what you have to say and the suggestions and the feedback that you have for us. And again, I want to thank you for being here, and I want to assure you that we are committed to producing an Olmstead plan that truly moves Minnesota forward. Based on your feedback and the input of disability experts, the sub-cabinet will devise its, or will actually will revise our draft plan and present a final version for consideration in November. The Olmstead plan is important for Minnesota. It is important for service providers, it's important for advocates. It is important for families. And most of all, it is important for people with disabilities. Your input is critical to developing an Olmstead plan that helps all of us better support people with disabilities. I am confident that by working together, we can develop a plan that ensures that all Minnesotans have the ability to live fulfilling lives with dignity and respect and the choices that allow them to live as independently as possible. And I see we have another member that walked in. And uh, would you please introduce yourself? Is this on? My name is Lynn Geshwind. I'm here to do the listening on behalf of the Department of Transportation for the state of Minnesota. My role there includes being the ADA coordinator for the agency. Thank you. And th there probably will be other members that will be joining us. Actually, here comes Commissioner Tingerthal. Seats available in the front, up here. 
Yes, please come and come and sit down. Commissioner Tingerthal, would you introduce yourself and Mary Tingerthal, Commissioner at the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Okay. Thank you. What I ask of all the commissioners and the members of the panel up here is that if you speak that you, um, during the hearing, and I remind you we're here to listen to the audience, but if there are times that we're speaking, please introduce yourself again um, so that, because this is being re recorded by CART Services um, and they would like to put the name of the speaker before it starts. And as people come up to speak, would you please give us your name before you start speaking? So at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Judy Plant, who is going to provide an overview of the Olmstead plan. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we want to provide just a little bit of context. Uh, many of you are very familiar with Olmstead plans and why Minnesota is embarking on this plan, uh, but we just want to rehearse for those who might not be as familiar, uh, a sort of a you are here conversation. The legal context for the Olmstead plan uh, comes from a, a, an Americans with Disability Acts case where the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it's unlawful to keep people with disabilities in segregated institutional settings when they can live in a community setting. That's supported by both the Minnesota Human Rights Act, which is state law, and the ADA, federal law, that prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. And under both state and federal law, government entities are required to ensure that all persons with disabilities can access services and programs. So what we're trying to create an Olmstead plan is a way for a government entity to document its plans to provide those services to individuals in the most integrated setting appropriate to the individual. And the U.S. Department of Justice explains that most integrated setting is one that enables individuals with disabilities to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. Minnesota is on this course for three reasons. One, developing a plan to increase integration is an ideal way to ensure that Minnesota complies with both the letter and the spirit of that Olmstead decision. Secondly, as part of a settlement in a particular case, Minnesota agreed to develop and implement a plan. And of course, this subcabinet was created by executive order uh, signed by Governor, Governor Mark Dayton uh, to develop and implement a plan. Some folks have asked what the uh, particular case was about. Jensen versus DHS uh, was a suit brought by three families. Uh, the parties to that case agreed upon a settlement that involved a number of things, including the agreement to develop and implement this plan. And the Lieutenant Governor's already gone through the membership here on the sub-cabinet, so we can move on. Okay, so our main steps for development of a plan are first to look at areas where Minnesota most often provides funding and services to people with disabilities. So essentially, what's the lay of the land right now? To analyze the service delivery in those areas, to identify impediments in the current delivery methods that prevent us from reaching the outcomes uh, as expressed in the Olmstead decision, and then to decide on changes needed to meet the standards of the Olmstead decision and a timeline to complete them. So this sub-cabinet has adopted a goal, which is Minnesota will be a place where people with disabilities are living, learning, working, and enjoying life in the most integrated setting. To achieve that, there are sub-goals for community engagement, employment, health care and healthy living, housing, lifelong learning and education, supports and services, and transportation. Specifically, we've identified, looks like, five of the seven goals at this point. In community engagement, people with disabilities will have the opportunity to fully engage in their community and connect with others in ways that are meaningful and aligned with their personal choices and desires. 
In employment, people with disabilities will have choices for competitive, meaningful, and sustained employment in the most integrated setting. In the healthcare and healthy living area, the draft language was not uh, completed at the time the subcabinet was considering goals. So as part of our final version, there will be language for that. In housing, people with disabilities will choose where they live, with whom, and in what type of housing. Lifelong learning and education is again an, a goal statement to be created, but the intent is to have one there. Supports and services, people with disabilities of all ages will experience meaningful, inclusive, and integrated lives in their communities, supported by an array of services and supports appropriate to their needs and that they choose. And finally, in transportation, people with disabilities will have access to reliable, cost-effective transportation choices that support the essential elements of life, such as employment, housing, education, and social connections. In terms of implementing the plan once it has been finally drafted and adopted by this subcabinet, uh, there will of course be consideration for funding. Uh, there will also be a need to seek authority from the state and federal level, perhaps to redirect funds from uh, institutional-like settings to most in integrated settings. Uh, many, we anticipate that many of the changes uh, in the plan could be accomplished within current state laws by agencies working together, and we are already doing that. And the legislature will be asked to consider revising laws so that changes in how we deliver services can be made. So finally, there's in information in this uh, PowerPoint handout on how to access the complete version of the plan and also how to access the online comments capability where you can submit written commentary. Thank you. And at this time now, what we would like to do is to receive comments from the audience. And I will start with um, people in order of which they have signed up. I do ask, again, that you please state your name before you start. And if you're representing an organization, identify what organization you're with. And then um, I will ask you to keep your comments to three minutes so that we can hear from everybody. If there's time at the end and there's something that needs, that you weren't able to, to state, then we will give you some additional time. But I would like to hear from as many people as possible. The first speaker is Lori Berner. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity and welcome to Duluth. My name's Lori Berner. I'm the executive director of UDAC. We are a day training and habilitation program um, that provide vocational and life enrichment services to people with disabilities and we've been in existence for just about 45 years. I've been in my role there for two years, just about in a couple days. And my 10 years prior to that, I was a program manager at RSI, Residential Services. And so I really feel, my whole career really, of 35 years I've been working with people with disabilities as well as have family members. And so it's something very, very near and dear to me and I feel very privileged to be here and speak on behalf. Um, number one, I really want you to know that I have the utmost respect uh, for the Olmstead decision. At RSI, I taught about it for many years to our staff explaining what it was about and I'm very excited about it for many, many reasons. I think that the women that uh, made it possible were very, very brave and did a wonderful thing. Our mission at UDAC is to provide uh, programs and services to people with disabilities based on their choice and the things that they want to do. And we offer services on a very wide spectrum for people that are very independent all the way to people that are very involved and everybody in between. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing because people can really come and, and participate where they are feeling um, comfortable and where they feel that they can continue to grow and develop. And I think that that's in very, very, very important that people have those choices. I think people gain choices and learn how to make informed choices through being educated 
have experiences, real personal experiences and opportunities that they can explore and grow and be able to make those decisions. And I think we need to really make sure that people are having those opportunities and that we're not trying to make choices for other people. I think there's a lot of ways that we can do that with adults, but we also need to do that with high school students and helping people get ready to leave high school and be be able to make those choices and actually at the time of graduation versus scrambling and being worried afterwards and parents being involved and learning as well. We need to really work on our community. Our community needs to do the integrating. We can't be forcing people or making it seem like that's what we're trying to do. We need to help and work with the community so that they're doing the integrating. It's a real win-win for everybody as we all know in this room. My concerns are that we be careful and that we're very thoughtful as we put the plan together for Minnesota. Minnesota is a great state. I'm originally from Illinois, Chicago area, and I know Minnesota is, is ahead of the game, and we always have been since I've been here for many, many years. But I just want to make sure that we, we remain thoughtful as we put this together. Keep listening to people, listening to people that it affects, the family members, close care providers. The funding needs to be in place. It's critical. It's challenging right now. UDAC just recently, um, uh, in October, finally got a supported employment license. It took me months and months and months to get that so that we could offer that opportunity to people that we serve and the people that will be coming in the future. It shouldn't be that hard. And now it's difficult because there's funding problems with actually people that want to get jobs in the community, but there isn't funding to help us support them in that way. We need to make sure that that is happening. Uh, we already addressed a little bit in your PowerPoint about transportation. Yes, it is a problem, urban and rural especially. And just finally, I just want to thank you very, very much. I want to thank you for listening. I thank you for going around the state, taking the time. I know everybody is very, very busy. But listening to clients, listening to families, listening to caregivers, it's just critical that you stay connected as this is going together and getting put together. Those day-to-day -day experiences are things that are... Th that will be important for you to keep in touch with because it's hard for you in your positions to do that. I don't look at it as a black and white issue. It is a very, very diverse issue and people are very diverse as well. But I think that predominantly if we look at providing education, opportunities for experience, that people will be able to make those informed choices and we will be successful. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. The next speaker is Len Roth Rothlisberger. And I'm going to call the next one, too, so that you're prepared. Richard Westcott. Thank you. Um, I'm here today actually wearing three hats so that you know who I am and, and what I'm speaking to. The first hat that I wear is that I am a chairperson on the uh, Minnesota Diversified uh, Executive Board. Second hat I'm wearing is for education. I'm a retired school administrator and we can't teach our kids what the vision unless we know what the future looks like for them. So I'm behind you there. The third hat I wear is that I have a daughter with developmental disabilities and she works at MDI and so I am a lifetime champion of uh, promoting anything that uh, involves uh, progress in this area. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity we have here today and I have a prepared statement that I'd like to read from MDI that is, uh, covers everything to a T, that way I won't miss anything. We believe uh, that the Olmstead Planning Committee and the State of Minnesota should encourage further development of the affirmative business enterprise model of employment services for people with disabilities in Minnesota. A definition of the affirmative business enterprise is that it's a social enterprise, usually a nonprofit 501c3, created specifically to provide jobs with competitive wages and benefits for people with disabilities. John Duran of Minnesota Diversified Industries created the concept in 1973 and simultaneously emphasized the importance of a blended workforce. A typical mix usually draws about 50% of the employees from the ranks of people with disabilities. The affirmative business enterprise model as operated by MDI in Minnesota and by other vocational rehabilitation organizations around the United States has significant advantages over the sheltered workshop model. 
ABE can produce positive outcomes with high levels of integration with employees without disabilities. Since 1964, MDI has been serving people with disabilities by offering progressive development and employment opportunities in a competitive business enterprise. These are real jobs that create a sense of pride, value, and independence in our, in our employees' lives. The jobs may pay competitive wages and comparable benefits, including health insurance. At MDI, we emphasize inclusion and equality. Today, MDI employs 307 people, of which 157 have documented disabilities. And we are in Grand Rapids, Hibbing, and St. Paul. In 2012, MDI's affirmative business enterprise employees with disabilities averaged 23 and a half hours per week, 10, 20 an hour, and an annual income of $14,441 plus benefits. The Wilder Research Foundation did a study of the social return on investment of Minnesota diversified industries, which was completed in February of 2011 and is available on MDI's website. A partial list of the results include that participants realize gains in earnings and fridge benefits, taxpayers realize reduced public assistance payments and administrative costs and increased tax contributions. Please consider ABE as an excellent vehicle in a positive movement towards full employment with people with disabilities in our community. Do I have any time left? I've got one last thing. You to have add. 22 seconds. I, I, have 22 I haven't figured seconds. out how to work this yet. I'm okay. going backwards now. <laughs> I would just like to state from a personal standpoint that I am excited about this as a parent with, son, with one with developmental disabilities. For 10 years, my daughter struggled to find stable employment. Eight years ago, she was hired by MDI. She finally feels validated and affirmed because she is working for a company that has a mission to support people with disabilities. These individuals are her friends on the job and her extended family. She loves her job. She punches into a clock every day just like a normal person, and she said she would be lost without this job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming to testify. The next speaker is Richard Westcott, to be followed by Dave Carvonen. Hello, my name is Richard Westcott. And I work at MDI in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to come here today to tell you a little about myself. I'm here today to tell you how important having a good job had made a difference in my life. I have hearing and speech impairment. I have had a job in the past, however, the wages and the hours were not what I need to pay my bill or to save up for any extras. I started at, uh, at started working at MDI on November 6, 2012 at a temp and was hired full time after completing my required hours, proving I would come to work as scheduled and getting along with coworkers. MDI is a great place to work. The hours are great and there's a lot of room to grow within the company. MDI paid is great. There are very few companies that pay above minimum wages for people with disability. The service they provide to people with disability are also the great benefits. MDI staff is always willing to help me. They have helped me with things like phone calls because I'm not always an third. They have helped me fill out the paperwork because I don't always understand what I am reading. The staff is always will, willing to help with any issue I might need help with 
at M MDI people with disability have the opportunity to be active members of a great team. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker, Dave Carvonen, and followed by John Nelson. Good afternoon. My name is Dave Carvonen, and I work on second shift at MDI okay. in Hibbing. I started having serious migraine headaches when I was about 10 years old. In 1998, I was working at a company as a line assembler for production of forklifts. I was let go because I was missing too much work due to the severity of my migraines. The doctors were unable to find long-term relief from my headaches as I began to receive Social Security. Could you pull the microphone just a little bit closer? Thank you. Okay. Three, year ago, three years ago, my fiance and I moved to Hibbing. In the spring of 2012, my headaches were becoming less often, so I started looking for a part-time job to help supplement my income. I also wanted to start providing more for my family after my daughter was born in January. I was suffering from depression, not being able to support my child. My self-esteem was extremely low as I felt I wasn't doing my job as a parent. In May, I was able to find work at MDI as a temporary employee. When I started working at MDI, I was still suffering from migraines occasionally, but the company was willing to accommodate my needs when necessary. When it was brought to their attention that lightly tinted safety glasses may help the headaches, they gladly offer them to me. The little things have made a big difference in how frequent I have had missed work. In October 2012, I was hired on as a full-time MDI employee. This made me happy because it meant that they thought highly enough of me. They wanted me to stay on permanently. With the accommodations and support from MDI, I was able to maintain a full-time position and no longer receive Social Security benefits. MDI has provided me with many learning opportunities. In past jobs I have worked, there was no cross-training or ability to prove that you were good enough to move up in the company. I've learned many things at MDI besides just folding a tote. I've learned how to operate the welders, how to adjust the temperature of the welders, and inspecting. My supervisor noticed my attention to detail was very good, and I was given an opportunity to work in quality. I was reluctant to accept the responsibility because I was afraid I might fail. With my super supervisor's encouragement and support, I proved that could be done. Our team's reject, reject rate dropped from 0.5% to under 2% within a month when I started. I was able to try and save every tote we made and came up with a few ideas to keep rejects from happening in the first place. The confidence I was gaining from doing such a good job and more importantly, feeling that I was a key part of the success of the team. I was also making some very good friends this was very important to me since moving to Hibbing, I was basically hiding in my own personal shell. I didn't want any friend, I didn't have any friends and really had no way of getting to know people. Because of my co-workers, management, and the entire MDI organization, I plan to continue to work for a very long time. I can't, to, I can't think of any job that I would rather be working right now. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you. John Nelson, followed by Graydon Groby. Hello, my name is John Nelson. I'm the Executive Director of Residential Services Incorporated, or RSI. And RSI serves people with any disability. Um, we serve, uh, have services in eight different counties in a variety of settings. We have an ICFDD, adult foster care, child foster care, board and lodge, as well as in-home settings, apartments, homes, um, and respite. And I, I'm here to bring up two concerns I have with the Olmstead plan. Uh, the first is with the DHS section of the plan. And again, as a provider, I might be a little sensitive, but as I read the list of barriers, it seems to indicate that, um, that providers and, and residential settings are almost part of the problem and a barrier, and, and I would like to make sure that as, as, as the subcommittee, you, you know that that's not the case. ARM, the State Association of Providers, has been leading the way in reform ideas. In 2012, we passed several reform ideas 
that are out front but very much in line with what Olmsted Group is looking at. Things like um, opening up multifamily housing, trying to incent providers to downsize um, adult foster care settings by providing some financial incentives to do it, to um, creating more flexible service options so people could create the types of supports they need when they move out of residential settings. And unfortunately, all of those ideas were, were passed but have yet to be acted on. And so I guess my concern is that the language makes it look like providers are the problem. I'd just like to note that first of all, the system is the way it is by, because that's what DHS has built. And secondly, that we've been working with the department trying to, to lead the way on reforms. And I understand that there are reasons they haven't moved forward, a lot to do with CMS and the federal government. But anything that Olmstead can do to push these reforms will be greatly appreciated. And know, number one, <laughs> that unless you do something about a, a good qualified workforce to support people in the community, everything else is going to be doomed for failure. My second point is about the use of technology to support people with disabilities and, and, and to live more independently. I think the report is very lacking in addressing technology and the value technology is as kind of a virtual staff and support. And it could help across every goal you have, whether it's transportation, housing, because, because at this point, people that need to get to an appointment can often get to that appointment without leaving their home. And people who need staff in some rural settings can now get um, uh, electronic monitoring where, where family members and staff people can monitor that and know their routines or if their routines are upset. And know all of that exists now. And it could get people out of their um, residential settings now. But the funding doesn't make it easy. And then secondly, so, so certainly look at how DHS funds technology and how we can make it easier. And lastly, and this is a very big picture item, but broadband capacity around the state is we, we operate in eight counties and so we experience what it's like to put technology in a variety of rural settings and it's very challenging. I can tell you right now that there are people who could live in their community with technology who can't because we don't have the broadband capacity in those areas. So anything that the governor, and I know that there's a, some type of a technology group that's out there working and maybe they need to be part of this group at some point to I talk am. about. I am, I'm part of that group, so. Hopefully you can I connect the two. Message. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize that Dr. Ed Ellinger Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Health has joined us. Mr. Groby. Thank you. <clears throat> and the next speaker will be Roberta Sitch. My name is Graydon Groby. I live here in Duluth, Minnesota. I am the father of John Groby, who has had mental and physical health disabilities from nine years of age. We have often struggled to keep John out of institutional care since we first dealt with his disability from the age of nine, 54 years ago. Until recently, he received support from HRA to provide housing, which has been withdrawn with the accusation that we committed fraud and criminal behavior. In July of 2011, Two investigators came to my home unannounced and spent over an hour. They stated that they were from the HRA Office of Investigator General, OIG, and the State of Minnesota Financial and Fraud Division, seeking information on the charge that we had an illegal relationship with HRA. They concluded that they found no evidence and would not pursue the matter further. In spite of the above conclusion, HRA in letters dated February 13, 2012, has continued to demand that we owe them a total of $53,492. It is apparent that HRA has not reviewed and understood the letter we received from their office, which was dated January 8, 1998, written by Bud Grant, 
HRA Occupancy Specialist, in which he stated as follows, we do not feel there were any intentions to defraud our rental program and are acting accordingly. Obviously, some miscommunication occurred, but that may well have been solely on our part. Thank you, John, for your openness and cooperation in this matter. Your involvement was instrumental in clearing up the entire issue. Your records are very thorough and we ask that you please continue to keep such detailed records for future annual re-examinations. We have followed the advice and guidelines as provided by HRA's attorney who initially reviewed our case. Our attorney and our financial advisor specializing in disabilities have reviewed and approved our financial process. It appears to us that this is a blatant case of harassment. The pressure to institutionalize John has been enormous. The withholding of essential housing and medical supports that are vital for John to remain in the community has been devastated. devastating. It has led to consequences for John and our family which have been very damaging. Thank you. Mr. Groby, I'll speak with you after the meeting. Maybe I can help you with some of that. Thank you, Yvonne. <laughs> Roberta Sitch, followed by Bridget Riversmith. Hi, um, my name is Roberta Sitch. I am the executive director of Access North, Center for Independent Living of Northeastern Minnesota. Um, I first of all want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank you for all of the work that you put into this plan, and I read every one of the 85 or 86 pages too, just so you're aware. It's, it's big, and, and, and that's a wonderful thing because, because you're really looking at the barriers that people with disabilities are facing, and you're trying to address them at, at many levels. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what Centers for Independent Living do, what we do. Our mission is to assist people with disabilities to live independently and have the same choices as, and opportunities as all people. So as you can see, what our mission is and, and has been um, is, is right along the lines of, of what you're working to do with um, the proposed Olmstead plan. Uh, we provide services to nine counties in northeastern Minnesota. Um, last year, we provided direct service to over 1,500 people. All of the services we provide are to help people with disabilities to live independently in their own homes. And so that's everything from independent living skills to, um, to helping them get connected with resources to, um, to helping them with, with finding employment that meets their needs. We have a personal care attendant program that now provides services to 350 individuals, all of whom would be at risk of institutional placement if they didn't receive these services in their home. Um, we've been doing it, like I said, for over 25 years with, with very few resources, but, but I think very successfully. Um, and as is noted in your plan, there are still some areas in Minnesota, I believe 11 counties, that don't have independent living services available, and that's because of a lack of resources. Um, but I'm very proud of what we do and, and wanted to share that with you in case you're not familiar with us. And also because, you know, not just to sing our praises, which I like to do so I can do more if you wish, but just to let you know that, that that's what Centers for Independent Living do, and there's a lot of us out here, other organizations that provide these services and supports to people um, to help them live independently, and so to use us as resources as you go forward in developing your plan. Um, all of our services are consumer-directed and self-determined. At Centers for Independent Living, 51% of our staff and our board of directors are people with significant disabilities. So it's, it's those, you know, those of us who, who um, are, are directly affected. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to talk about is with the Olmstead decision. We, we've been familiar with it for many, many years. And like the ADA to us, it's a civil rights decision. This is, you know, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in the policy and the procedure and, you know, looking at it almost as a social welfare decision, but to us it's a civil rights 
decision. It's what says, you know what, segregating people with disabilities is discrimination. And I'm seeing through this plan that you're really addressing integration and inclusion, more importantly, at all levels. Um, I'm speaking to you as the executive director, of course, but also as a person with a disability. So it's, this is something that is very you know, near and dear to my heart as well because it's so important for Minnesota to go, to go forward with this. Um, encourage you to use those of us who have been doing this work for so many years, and you've heard some of the speakers already and you'll continue to. Um, we've been doing it, we know what works, we know what doesn't work, and we know what the barriers are. So again, thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you. And I know I told um, the members of the panel up here that we are here to listen, but I don't want to inhibit you if you need clarifying questions or any, any comments. And this is uh, Robert, Bridget Riversmith, is that correct? And the next speaker is Laura Birnbaum. Um, I'm a person with a disability, a member of Self Advocates Minnesota, a public speaker, an award-winning artist and founder, co-leader of the Arrowhead Alliance of Artists with Disabilities. I've lived in institutions, um, in group homes, crisis shelters, homeless shelters, where I was told that I was a drain on society. And I worked at uh, sheltered workshops like Goodwill, where I was told that I was unfit for higher education and uh, training um, at, and employment opportunities at um, anything more than sub, uh, sub minimum wages. Um, so, but I have um, navigated the system and I've achieved greater independence by advocating for my own person-centered planning. So that's me. Um, I've also read everything you put on your website, including your meeting minutes. And so I feel like I've been there with you. And uh, I wanted to give you some advice. Um, you're really focused on integration and I think that's great. Um, and because uh, I've, I've really felt like um, due to my disability, I've gotten the message that unless I can measure up to being normal, I can't be included. Um, so, but I noticed that you focus on jobs, on employment first, and um, there's really no mention of entrepreneurship or higher education, mentoring, apprenticeships, um, professions, business ownership, partnerships, um, I actually got help through, um, took a lot of advocating and convincing, but I got help to write my own business plan through uh, the Department of Rehab Services um, after I convinced them that I did not need to stay at Goodwill. Um, and I've had my own business for um, uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, so um, I want to uh, instead give you an idea um, which I want to develop here in Duluth uh, that really focuses on um, integration. And uh, so um, also please uh, focus in, in all of your goal areas on universal design um, and universal design and learning. Um, uh, these are principles which um, remove barriers uh, from the phys physical and social aspects of our environment. And then also, um, what, I, what I envision are co community innovation centers that focus on person-centered planning, education, mentoring, entrepreneurial training and incubation, sustainable, environmentally focused business planning, art, and science. Um, it, uh, it really um, uh, follows the social model of disability with removing barriers um, that create disability, inequality, and disintegration. Um, so uh, I noticed that you're really focusing on community-based community uh, strategies for helping people to support people. Um, so um, the last is a, is a bit of advice for the state. And um, because I, I think um, you're really focusing and some people, you're worrying people um, uh, who have uh, been working um, uh, within the institutionalized kind of sheltered environments. You're, you're, you're transitioning away from that. I also see all of your agencies as sheltered environments, um, perpetuating um, stereotypical and um, 
inst with institutionalized stigma, the treatment of people with disabilities. Um, you're thinking along established ruts. And I want you to climb out of those, use all the people that come to all your listening sessions and listen to them and do something different. Because a lot of what you're saying in, in, in the plan so far is continue to do what we're already doing. And first of all, you're replicating a lot of what we're doing. Like, um, I'm, I'm a self-advocate, and I do that for volunteer work, you know? I'd also like to get paid to do it, because I'm skilled at it, I'm good at it, and so are my peers. So we don't need you to do that. Support us in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Roberta Ompaim has a question of the last speaker. Actually, I don't have a question, okay. but stay standing. I think that you've demonstrated to us that um, stereotypes of what people with disabilities can achieve be simply because they were once institutionalized in their life is you're demonstrating that you're breaking those barriers and I've always heard and would like to remind the group that the biggest barrier to the accomplishments of people with disabilities are the attitudes of people without disabilities. So. Laura Birnbaum, followed by Julie Gitrin. Thank you for your time today. Um, my name is Laura Birnbaum, and I am the Northeast Community Organizer for SAM, or Self Advocates of Minnesota, as well as an advocacy coordinator here in Duluth for ARC Northland. So SAM, um, if you're not familiar, is a statewide network of self-advocacy groups that support people with disabilities to be their own advocates and active members in the human, civil, and disability rights movements. I feel that there are multiple ways that the Olmstead Plan can be a vehicle for real change by setting progressive standards that should be expected, invoking dignity and respect and breaking down the many barriers to independence, rights, and opportunities for informed choice that currently exist for people with disabilities. With limited time, I've chosen a few areas to quickly and briefly expand upon. So the Northeast region of our state is in need of increased leadership training opportunities for self-advocates. We cover a large rural area where many individuals do not have opportunities to connect with other self-advocates and gain more knowledge, confidence, and skills to be active leaders in the state. By including self-advocacy, peer-to-peer support, and leadership training opportunities into the Olmstead Plan, self-advocates would have an increased ability to create change within the system that impacts their lives on a daily basis. This is crucial as people with disabilities are the largest stakeholders at hand yet are not always heard as the loudest. I mentioned informed choice previously. We often hear about choice, the choice, choice between which agency one might receive services from, the choice between where wants to, one wants to live and with whom, which job one might want to apply for. But informed choice is not telling someone what their options are, but really increasing life experiences so that individuals have more to draw from to make that choice. People need to be supported in these choices and experiences in ways that promote community inclusion and allow individuals to contribute and be active based on their skills, interests, talents, and abilities. Peer-to-peer -peer supports through self-advocacy groups such as SAM and our local People First chapter in Duluth offer such support and have so much potential to do so much more with increased self-advocacy, human rights, and leadership training. Lastly, on behalf of the People First chapter in Duluth, when asked what issues are most important to them, and a few members are here, but most couldn't make it because they do work today, so in the future it might be great to have a session in the evening that would be more accessible. Um, but employment opportunities is at the top of the list, often with the phrase, we want real work for real pay. We fully support the Olmstead Plan goal that people with disabilities will have choices for competitive, meaningful, and sustained employment in the most integrated setting but we advocate that these choices be informed, including increased opportunities for work experiences beyond the traditional custodial and food prep skill building experiences for transition aged youth with disabilities. 
We hope that the Olmstead plan can set a standard with person-centered planning at its core, again, where an individual's interests and skills are central, and that we work to support a person in finding or creating a real job that fits and benefits both employer and employee, rather than fitting a person to the limited job opportunities that we perceive to exist. We advocate for increased wages, reducing and working to eliminate the number of people employed in or at risk of being employed in non-integrated settings, earning sub-minimum wages, and doing this in a mindful way to avoid um, unintended and potentially harmful consequences. This would include partnering with certified community rehabilitation programs to work on transitioning from shelter workshops to community-based services, as well as embracing employment-first principles. I want to close here with gratitude for your time and hope that you will hear the voices of self-advocates, advocates, and allies as you take on this task and shape opportunities for change for people with disabilities in our state. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julie Dietrin, followed by Don Samuelson. Hi, my name is Julie Jetron, and Jetron is close enough. And I'm, I am really grateful that all of you are here today. Um, I also am an individual with a disability, and contrary to my device here, my main disability is mental health disability. And um, I don't know how many other people are here or how many organizations are here. I just found out about it yesterday. And um, I, I think it tends to be an underrepresented portion of the population when it comes to things like this, we have, I think we have less people supporting us. Last year, Bridge House, which was a place we could go to to get our self together besides the hospital was closed down. Now I've heard numerous stories of my friends going to hosp the hospital here and they have to be sent out state, away from their peers, away from their support. Um, so we don't sometimes have the basic things we need. Um, I've had major challenges myself this year with transportation, Housing, um, by the way, I've gotten some great help from some of the organizations here. And, um, and, and uh, trans transportation, housing, and employment. Um, I also have been self-employed throughout this time, um, off and on, and a lot of my peers um, aren't able to work, and I, I really wish there would be some uh, tr translatability uh, between like employment versus like volunteerism. If people could get out of, I'm, I'm on MAEPD, which gives me enough income barely to live in society. But there's always this challenge of finding a job, and I'm, a, I'm kind of a round peg. I don't really like to fit in the square holes. Most of us are. And, um, and to find a job that will, you know, most people want people to work 10, 15 hours a week. And I, I'm not always sure if I can do that in a square peg kind of job. Um, so uh, if, if people were able to like, be in MAEPD and with volunteering and getting hours that was more flexible, giving value to the community, that might be something that some of my peers could do. Most of my peers don't have computers, I can't afford you know, computers or sometimes even phones. Um, and so I wanted to reiterate uh, some of the things that Bridget said. By the way, she's an amazing artist. So if you look up Red Rabbit Riversmith on the computer, I mean, that, that woman's astounding. I co-founded um, co Odd with her, Arrowhead Alliance of Artists with Disabilities, and I've been a, had the dubious title of consumer for like, I don't know, 20 some years now. Um, <clears throat> but I just, I, I just wanted to say one of the things that I, I did when I was reading the Olmstead plan over, and I read a lot of it, but I had to skim some of it, it seemed like this big kind of tin man, like an Iron Man kind of thing with a big heart, but kind of bulky, and all of the agencies that are really caring, but it's like working from the top down versus the foundation up. And so one of the things we've always said in, in our movement is nothing about us without us. So if there'd be some way to like go out and reach people, talk to people, and our only drop-in center in Duluth just had to move to West Duluth, and is run by HTC. Drop-in centers in Minneapolis are fabulous, ways to keep people out of the hospital and engaged. Um, but if we could reach people in our various organizations or communities and, and really ask us, what do we need and what do we want? I think it would just be great to like build a foundation and then maybe help the heart of this beast of the agencies to be effective. Um, uh, we have a lot of creative agencies, um, Choice, ARC, um, Access North um, in Duluth that have worked outside of the box with creating you know, employment opportunities for people. 
And um, so I want to just say that I appreciate that and that I wouldn't be here today without the already great services that we do have. They have kept me alive. And oh, and now it's my time is up. So thanks so much. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Don Samuelson followed by Linda Schoberg. And as Don is coming forward, I have failed to recognize that Commissioner Kevin Lindsay from the Department of Human, Serv or Human Rights has joined us. So, Don. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Governor Solon and subcommittee <coughs> cabinet uh, members. We certainly thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak out about these important issues. And the hearings that you're holding around the state are vitally important. My name is Don Samuelson, and I am the chair of the Minnesota Board on Aging. I didn't want to recognize my two former colleagues who were here. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as they heard I was going to speak, they left. You know? <laughs> Representative Huntley and Representative Mary Murphy do an outstanding job for, uh, for us in Minnesota, and they certainly are strong supporters of people with disabilities and the aging. Don, Don has failed to say that he is a former president of the Senate. Thank you. <laughs> right now, it's more important to be president of the Minnesota Board on Aging. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the mission of the board is to ensure that older Minnesotans and their families are effectively served by state and local policies and programs in order to age well and live well. I'd like to first thank you for the important work in developing an Olmsted plan for Minnesota. You've captured many of the things that are important to people with disabilities of all ages in order for people to live in the way they want to live. This draft provides a solid foundation on which to build. Many older adults experience disabilities for the first time in the later years of their lives. These impairments are often due to the progression of chronic illnesses. Over two-thirds of persons 85 and older have at least one disability, and older persons are more likely to have multiple disabilities. Thus, the experience of older adults requires consideration in this plan. The board, the board did submit a written statement uh, as requested by your, your, uh, your group, and uh, those comments are on file. We also offered uh, statements at uh, other uh, uh, meetings, uh, including uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, and we don't want to repeat everything, but like to just build on some of that. First, we must ensure that older adults who are experiencing disabilities have access to in-home supports, regardless of their pay sources. This includes caregiver support, chore, homemaker, home-delivered meals, assisted transportation, personal emergency response systems, and environmental modifications. In order for older adults to be able to live where they choose, including their own home and community, it is critical that these supports are available statewide. Second, we need to ensure a strong transportation system are in place. As people age, a significant number will not be able to or choose not to drive. These individuals need reliable transportation systems in order to live in their homes and communities. Whether for medical appointments, shopping, religious services, congregate dining, family visits, or social cultural events, our transportation system must include a range of transportation options and must have a high degree of coordination in order to make most efficient use of our resources. Third, we must support older adults who choose to, to age in place in order for people to continue living in their homes as their disabilities increase. They must be able to have access to a cohesive system of home modifications. Older adults with limited incomes may need subsidies in order to make home modifications. And for those older adults who wish to or need to move out of their homes, as their needs increase, we must assure access to accessible and affordable housing. Finally, we must continue our work to integrate health care and long-term services and supports. The need for all types of services increases as a person's chronic illness progresses. 
A health crisis or a change in condition can result in hospitalization or eventually care transportation from hospital to home or nursing home to home. A coordinated system of health care and long-term support services can more effectively identify high-risk individuals, connect those individuals with needed services, and provide follow-up improvement and overall quality. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I wish you well on your decisions, and I know that you'll, uh, you'll do the absolute best for the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Schoberg, followed by County Commissioner Chris Dahlberg. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Schoberg, and I am involved with an 18-county um, mental health initiative in southwestern Minnesota. So I'm a long ways from home, um, but I'm very delighted to be here with you today. Um, I have been involved in mental health for 40 years. I came from the Regional Treatment Center um, <clears throat> venue and um, went out into the community and worked with the development of many of the community supports for the mentally ill. So I'm very pleased with you know, the development and the beginning phases of the Olmstead um, plan because I believe that we have felt all along that where people with disabilities and particularly people with mental illness um, need to live and deserve to live is in the residents um, of their own choices. I do think that, you know, the, I recognize that the overall responsibility for all the disabilities lie with the Department of Human Services. However, I believe that the plan lacks specificity. Um, disabilities are, they, they are diverse. Um, I don't think that you can develop a plan um, that is consistent across the board for each one of the disabilities. Um, they all have their unique needs in moving out into the community. The other piece that I really want to stress is the fact that Southwestern Minnesota, as are other parts of Minnesota, are very diverse in geography. There is a very rural nature um, to southwestern Minnesota, and uh, the needs down there are different from the metro area. Um, transportation, access to services um, is significantly different than in the metro area. Um, choice, um, it's not easy to offer consumers choice when there's only one provider in the county that they can have choice from. So there needs to be a, a buildup of availability of um, services. Um, the speakers previous to me who um, were for advocacy services, I think that that's one thing that we are very much lagging behind on is the involvement of consumers and the development of peer supports. Um, I know that the Department of Human Services has tried um, over the course of the last few years to develop a peer support, peer, peer specialist um, services, and there has, um, it, things like that get caught up in bureaucracy. And I think sometimes people coming out of um, a residential setting just need a peer that will help them get through that first day or get through a crisis situation. So I would really encourage, you know, the, the further development of that. I also believe that in order for people to have the opportunity to have st stable lives in the community, they need to be able to access a full continuum of services as they move through um, their treatment process. And if that is, begins with an, an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, um, we, we struggle sometimes to get people moved out of those because there is not the appropriate next level of care. And I think the department really does need to look at that. And the, the private providers, I think, have, have looked at that intensive step and are just plain not able to meet that need. I, I do believe that, that um, the state does have that responsibility to provide that step-down service. I also have a concern for what the 42 southern counties refer to as the 1%. Um, these are individuals with mental illness who 
are um, tend to be violent or aggressive and are not able to find the appropriate treatment option when they need it. They have ended up in jails. Um, and I know that there is some recent legislation that has occurred to get them out of there um, quicker. However, that is the reality. And in talking with um, jail administrators in southern Minnesota, you know, just having a greater access of services they feel would be much benefit, more, much more beneficial. Um, I, I um, would like to thank you for the opportunity to be able to provide this input. Um, I also am very pleased with the cross-agency um, work that is done um, between the Department of Human Services and in the area of housing and employment. I think we can also be very encouraged by the legislative action this year um, in regards to children's mental health. I think that we need to provide that foundation for individuals as they move up the, the um, continuum and perhaps into the future maybe there won't be so many um, issues and problems with people as they become adults um, within the mental health system. Thank so, you. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Chris Dahlberg, followed by Charlie Fedora. Uh, good afternoon, Lieutenant Governor and uh, panel members. Uh, welcome to Duluth, and thank you so much for the, the listening session. And to all the people, it's exciting to see uh, so many people here. And uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Pretner and I used to sit in this uh, room before. I, could, I forgot how hot it can get in here. <laughs> I wanted to tell before uh, the panel before I started a little bit about myself because I, I think it's important. First, I'll say I'm, I'm a St. Louis County Commissioner. My district is, is basically west Duluth from Masabi Avenue all the way out to the Wisconsin border. Uh, but I think it's also important to, to let you know that I'm 51 years old. And I was born in 1961. And the reason why that's important is uh, about 10 years before that, uh, my brother was born with developmental disabilities. And he had uh, severe, severe mental retardation uh, at about the equivalence of a, a three-year-old level. And uh, some, some people here, I see some younger faces, but uh, may not remember what it was like back then. And back then, we were living in ESCO, and the, uh, the minister came to my parents and said that uh, having such a child was uh, punishment from God for the sins of the parents. And, and so this was the atmosphere. But, you know, the beautiful thing is two, three years later, the minister came around, and they used to go on buses down to the Twin Cities to lobby for ARC. And at the time, that was when Humphrey was, was lobbying. And, and I also, as a young child, uh, when I was probably about 10, used to follow my brother around to Cambridge, uh, to Moose Lake, to Brainerd. And um, I don't know what else I can say, but it was god-awful institutions back then. And uh, you could smell the urine on the floor. Uh, it was terrible. Uh, you know, I didn't know when I was that young, why would uh, somebody, you know, uh, be in such a situation? And that's what my parents tried to do the best they could to figure out what, what services there were. Now he's living in Brookston, uh, Minnesota, and there's four individuals in there, and it, it's wonderful for him, and he's worked at, at Floodwood Vocational. So I want to say we need to keep on track, and the Olmstead plan is about having individuals with disabilities live in the least restrictive means. I wanted to raise some issues that I see that are some problems arising in the community, and I think we perhaps are moving a little bit astray of what the mission of the Olmstead was. And I'd like the panel members to, to leave here and think about this. And the, the two points I'd like to talk about is the issues of safety and the issues of concentration in neighborhoods. I've talked in the past about the issue of safety, safety, safety. I've used three safeties. It's the safety of the clients that live in these homes. It's the safety of the workers that are there. And it's the safety of the neighbors. And the reason why it's an issue is a couple years ago, we had a problem in Duluth where a gentleman on 70th Avenue West in a home was shot out in the, in the yard in the stomach. And the issue was this, is a, a person came up earlier and talked about uh, people with some severe disabilities. I think there are uh, and, and challenges. That's only the 1%. But I think we have to address that 1% and see what do we need to do. They, when, when I originally raised this, they said, Commissioner Dahlberg, this really isn't an issue. It could have happened just as well in your neighborhood. Someone could go off the end. 
And I said, really? And I researched it. And I presented a panel, and I wanted to say to the Department of Human Services, they're wonderful. Uh, and uh, they, I've met with them, uh, Commissioner Jensen. I really appreciate it. And the, and the whole uh, organization, they listened to me. And, and what the report that I presented was the issue uh, is that this individual was shot in the stomach. Six years earlier, they had another episode in a home where they assaulted two workers, that's why I talk about staff, and another individual with disabilities. And so you have to have a good mix. And so I'm stressing that, that going forward, we have to have the, the right mix. The other thing Olmsted says is on page 71, I think it's very important, it said individuals with disabilities should live, work, and receive services in the greater community like individuals without disabilities. And so uh, integration into the, the neighborhoods is, is key, and, I, and we're seeing that. I don't have a, a home actually where I live in Morgan Park, but I wouldn't have a problem, I'd welcome it. And, and that's you know the services they should have. I wanted to talk, I, I see some residents in my district from Parkwood, and I wanted to raise this because it's an area or a neighborhood with, I don't know, it's about 100 homes. But in the 100 homes, there's six group homes, and I think maybe they're moving into eight. And the individual thing that Olmsted talks about is they want to have integration so they're moving into like communities with people without disabilities. And so what you're starting to do is have a concentration of homes and you're losing the effect. And so you're starting to actually have districts. And so I want to, uh, and I know you're exploring that. I know there's been an inventory about why is there perhaps not enough services in the Twin Cities that are being met. And one of the individuals that the individual that was shot out on 70th Avenue West was from the Twin Cities. And I think when you have better caseworker integration, which is closer to home, and the individuals are living closer to the family, it'll help the individuals out. So they're complex issues. I just say a wonderful job. I think we've made light years as far as the state of Minnesota. And you're looking back at what it used to be. It's you know it's a sad thing that somebody had to go through it. But you know my my brother's now got a beautiful life. And, and it's wonderful, and I want uh, everybody should be able to have that opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Charlie Fedora, and then I'm going to call on Mary Metzger, and then we're going to take about a five-minute break after that. Good afternoon. My name is Charlie Fedora, and I do live in the Parkwood dis District, where uh, Chris is the commissioner. And my concern is with the... Uh, overpopulation of the group homes in our division. As Chris pointed out, uh, there's about 100 homes up there. We currently have uh, eight, what, I, what is being referred to as group homes. So I don't know if your panel exactly is targeting group homes. Uh, the group homes that are there are comprised of uh, both mentally and physically disabled persons. Uh, none of which that I, I'm aware of uh, are capable of employment and probably of limited training and education. The homes that are in there are owned by corporations. The corporations are providing a setting for these disabled people. Now, in your, I haven't read the whole thing completely, but I did have a chance to browse through the Olmstead plan, and one of the things that you indicate is that these people uh, the physically and mentally disabled people have choice of where they want to live. Well, my contention is that if they are mentally and physically disabled, they may not have a choice. They may be forced to go to wherever the corporations decide to put their businesses. The other thing, I, I would like to ask a question. Of about a year ago, when this problem came up in the Parkwood edition, there apparently was a moratorium on the establishment of group homes in the state of Minnesota. Is that still in effect? Does anybody know? Yes. It still is? Okay. Commissioner well, Jessen, would you like to respond? What, um, yes, and if you have some specific questions kind of about that, um, Assistant oh. Commissioner Lauren Coleman, do you want to raise your, if you turn around and raise your hand, I think uh, Assistant Commissioner Coleman can talk with you if you have some specific afterwards. Okay after your comments if you have uh, more specific questions. Okay. Well, my concern is, is that within the last month there have been three homes that have been sold in the Parkwood Edition. We know for sure that one of them is being remodeled for a group home. Uh, a second one is being 
uh, operated as a family that's taking care of a mentally or physically challenged person, which, you know, I don't have any objections to that. But what we are in the Parkwood addition, the biggest objection that we have is that we're becoming saturated. We currently have eight or nine of these homes. We're going to have another one. There's two adjacent to us out on uh, Morris Thomas Road, so actually you're, you're closer to 12 with, within a, uh, probably less than a mile square mile area so I, I would in, uh, implore you people to consider how you concentrate these group homes and if your focus is group homes to you know like Chris said you're not integrating them you're forming districts and you're going right back into a kind of a institutional uh, atmosphere anyway um, the other thing I would like to say is if if you're going to put these group homes, I would like to see some type of guideline to say, like in the city of Duluth, you can't have a liquor store within a thousand feet of a school. Okay, don't. Or in, the, in, in Duluth, we have a, a problem with the number of rental people that are here, and they came up with a 300-foot rule that you couldn't have more than one within 300 feet. So, I would implore you to limit the number of group homes in a, in a given area. Thank you. Mary Metzger. I'm Mary Metzger from Itasca Life Options in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. You can't hear me? Sorry, I'm Mary Metzger from Itasca Life Options in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Um, the agency I work for is a DT&H and, and a long, long time ago clean with work there. I have a couple of suggestions and then I'll bring up the M word. First, I, as we are looking for employment for people with disabilities across the broad spectrum, I would hope that you would have conversations with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, oftentimes in smaller communities, it's very difficult to get an in um, to employment possibilities for people. So if you haven't contacted them, I would hope that you would consider that. Um, the other thing is, in the, in the area of transportation, I would hope that there would continue to be um, um, allowing people with disabilities to use the commuter runs as opposed to having their own buses. Um, when people are allowed to ride the bus with everybody else, then they're integrated into their community and they have relationships. So I would hope that that would um, continue to happen specifically in rural areas. And then I'm going to ask that you consider some training. I happen to be a guardian of a young woman who has a developmental disability, but a very volatile behavior, challenging behavior, and oftentimes is in the company of police officers. Um, I would ask that you would consider training for the law enforcement across the state of Minnesota, not just for people with developmental disabilities, but people with mental health issues, um, our whole gamut of people, um, if, we, if our folks end up with law enforcement, they, oftentimes they just don't know how to deal with them. Okay? And then the other thing I'd ask for is that there be some specific training across disabilities to our medical communities. So people aren't shoved off or not um, provided adequate care because a physician does not know what to do for them. And finally, I'm going to bring up the M word because no one else has said it today, and that is, this is a really great plan, folks, but we need money to be able to put it into place. As a provider of services, and I would hope that I'm also a person who accompanies others in their journey of life, that people whether they're people with a disability or the people who accompany them through life actually have real pay for the real jobs that they do. Um, I made the trip to the Twin Cities yesterday and MPNR every three hour, every two, every hour told me that the state contracts um, for people um, working for the state of Minnesota were going to get 3% increases in pay for the one year at a time for the next two years. So Please consider the fact that most of the people that work in our fields are very, very passionate and 
and we only do it because we really sincerely can care about the people that we that we work with so maybe we could go into real wages for all of our real jobs thank you thank you At this time, we will take a break until 25 minutes to 3, and then we'll come back. Thank you. This with the testimony, it's really helpful for us as we think about going forward with the Olmstead plan. So um, I want you to know that we are listening to you, that, that your input is very, very important. The next speaker is Sherry Fedora. And following her is Mary Kershey or Kershing, I'm not sure. Okay. Sherry Fedora. Oh, we'll come back. Mary Kershey? Kershing? We lost people, huh? Either of you, Sherry Fedora or Mary? Okay, good. Having a conversation with a gentleman in the hallway. Okay. Hi, my name is Sherry Fedora, and I am a Parkwood Development resident. I have lived there for 10 years. It's a beautiful, beautiful development. We are a development of probably about 100 homes. I am going to read a letter to you from our neighbor who is unable to attend today because he is out of town on business. I'm hoping to get done in time so that I can also throw in a few words about how I feel as a resident and as a neighbor who takes pride in her property and how that is being let go by many of the workers who come to the homes in our neighborhood and fling their cigarette butts in my yard, who don't empty their trash, or the trash is so overflowing it flies out, of, out on the street, or the cars that rip by at a speed that is far beyond 30 miles an hour. First, I will read the letter. It is from a Mr. John Milak Milakcic, and he lives at 2927 Palisade Drive. This letter is addressed to Commissioner Dahlberg. Thank you for the letter regarding the public hearing on adult foster care homes. I would be attending the meeting in person, but unfortunately, I will be out of town for business on August 13th. Had I had a little more time or notice, I would have changed my schedule to be at the meeting, as this is a major concern of mine. I would like to thank you for staying engaged in the foster care situation in our area. As you know, the Parkwood development in which I live is now home to seven foster care homes. That has now increased to nine. This is a newer subdivision of Duluth, which quite frankly has been overrun by foster, care, foster home operations. We are subjected to younger worker who with shift changes at 7, 3, and 11 p.m., seven days a week. Speed and noise have increased dramatically as workers are trying to get to their job on time or eager to get home. Radios blare as the cars come and go from the neighborhood. In addition, garbage cans are left out all week and cigarette butts are discarded en masse and left to blow around the neighborhood. All of this has taken away from a neighborhood feel and made our subdivision feel like a light industrial park. To rectify the situation, I would ask the Department of Human Services to do a couple of things. Number one, ideally licenses in high density foster care areas should be rescinded. A fair ratio of one foster care home per 150 houses should be adopted for those individuals from the area to live in. Area should be defined as some square mileage in correlation to where the individual was raised. 
We currently have people living in our area from Brainerd, Minneapolis. In the event that the Department of Human Services is not willing to go that far, no new licenses should be approved in St. Louis County due to the saturation that we are currently experiencing. Finally, a special tax should be passed where foster care operators are required to pay the per pupil tax for every resident that is housed in a foster care house. Every time a residential home is turned into a foster care home, it is one less home where a family based on student population or family where can move in and send their children to the local school. This is negatively impacting state funding based on student population in that school. Foster homes should have to make a payment directly to the state to be put back into the district for each resident they house. The rate should be commensurate to the per pupil funding formula currently in place. This would ensure that school districts are held harmless when foster care homes overtake an area. Thank you to the Minnesota Department of Human Services for coming to Duluth and spending time listening to the concerns of the community. I look forward to witnessing positive change to this program as the subdivision I moved into 17 years ago has not changed for the better with the advent of light industrial businesses moving in around me. I see I have a minute left. I've lived in the Parkwood development for 10 years. We have a beautiful home. We take very good care of our property. We have gardens that we enjoy. We have wildlife that we sometimes don't enjoy, such as the deer. I do not enjoy the speed that goes through the neighborhood. We do not have sidewalks. You're asking that the residents be engaged or integrated in neighborhoods or communities. Well, then you know what? You better put 15 mile an hour speed limit signs up because we currently have a young man who is hearing impaired, who has a motorized wheelchair, who goes through the neighborhood, no sidewalks. Cars do not drive at a safe speed. I had a UDAC bus this morning that had a hard time keeping his bus on a curve going around Parkwood. They don't need to drive that fast. I walk with my dog every morning. I shouldn't have to worry about a UDAC bus hitting me or one of the workers hitting me because he's late getting to work or she's late getting to work. This is a safety issue no matter how you look at it when you are incorporating these homes into neighborhoods. Quiet once we're quiet neighborhoods. I have absolutely nothing <laughs> against the residents moving into these homes. Yes, they need to be there. But yes, you better take more concern about the safety of the neighbors that you put these homes in. I am not a happy camper. Come to Parkwood. I invite you. I would love to have you come. We had a neighborhood meeting at our house about a year ago. Do you know how many people fit in my living room? 60. 60 people came to our home because they are concerned about the safety issues that are going on in Parkwood. The young people who come to work there they have no ownership. This isn't their home. I don't care if I fling a cigarette butt in her yard. I don't care if I have a car with a loud muffler. I don't care if I'm a UDAC bus. I'm, I'm late. I have to get to my next, my next place where I have to pick up the next resident. Thank, thank you. Come and see me. I'd love to have you come and visit. I'm going to have um, Commissioner Jessen make some comments. I'm trying to, um, you know, in, engage in a back and forth here. We really are here to listen. But I thought since a couple of people made comments about this that I would just uh, provide some information 
And also, for those of you who want to talk with us about this afterwards, you know, uh, there's several of us in the department here that would be happy to, to, uh, to stick around and talk with you. You know, I do think that um, there is more concentration in St. Louis County um, of um, adult foster homes, so, you know, what you're referring to as group homes, uh, than in many other parts of our states, and that I certainly there are some people here who are not from St. Louis County. Um, that is something that we are working to, um, you know, address uh, with the county, and I think we had folks from the department actually meeting with some county uh, officials this morning. You know, there it is important from the from our perspective uh, to have individuals living in the in the community. Uh, we want to do that in a fair and appropriate way, and so we really are trying to work with the county on that. Uh, there was a mention earlier about kind of a moratorium, and was there a moratorium? Yes, there is a moratorium, but I think then people say, well, then how do you open up, you know, a new one? Well, there's a moratorium on the number of licenses. So sometimes one home may be closed and another one open. So I just wanted to, to clarify that as well since that came up. But I think finally, this is, I think what I take away, and I just say this as one member of the Olmstead sub-cabinet from a lot of this, is when we're talking about the importance of integration, we also need to be sensitive to uh, concentration in neighborhoods when we're to have true integration, and, and I certainly understand um, that point. But, but just for the broader context, uh, for those of you who are concerned about this particular issue, you know, we're here as a sub-cabinet of the administration. Uh, the, the lieutenant governor is leading. This is not just about the Department of Human Services. And I say that because we're happy to talk with indiv individuals who are specifically concerned about the department issues, but this really, this sub effort uh, to make sure that people with disabilities um, are you know, integrated in the, in the community where they live, where they work, where they play, is not just something for the Department of Human Services. If it was, and a couple of people said something along those lines, because if it was, then it would just, you'd just see the department here, but it's really, really crosses our state and crosses issues for people, whether they're on public programs or not. You know, it's, are they going to be able to kind of have, to, to take the transportation that, you know, uh, to be able to be on the buses, to get the education they need. It's not just about uh, individuals who are on public programs. And so this is very much, I think, an administration uh, approach. So I did want um, just to, I think, if, just to clarify, given a few of the recent comments of uh, that Lieutenant Governor, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is, I think Mary Kersling, she did. Okay. Um, the next speaker is Mike Ryan and Tom Engstrom. And that's followed by Rick Hammergren. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming here. We really appreciate your time. Uh, it's very important uh, that you show up here and that we are present and uh, get uh, positive feedback and let you hear the issues that we have. Uh, my name is Mike Ryan. I am the executive director of ARC Northland. We're a nonprofit agency that works with people with disabilities and we advocate for them. Um, a couple of things I uh, was just going to mention one item, but I thought I'd mention a couple other ones. Um, we had talked about the importance of employment with people with disabilities, but I haven't heard a whole lot today on the discussion of transportation. And the transportation is an issue if you have an individual that has disabilities being able to get on and off a bus or in and out of a cab those types of things are essential to employment. So when you start looking at employment, uh, please remember that we also need transportation in conjunction with that. So just as a comment there. Um, what we'd like to talk about now is uh, we, we take a look at housing. We do a lot of advocacy for individuals to get into housing, uh, to help them to get into the most integrated uh, type of environment that, that they can uh, be able to get into. And rather than going through some um, resume of different things, what I thought would be appropriate would be uh, to have Tom Ingstrom, who is our 
uh, housing uh, support specialists basically give you a, a couple of real life examples of how we've been able to help individuals and maybe give you a little better feel for the types of stuff that we are able to do if we have the funds to do it. So, Tom. Thank you, Mike. I'm Tom Engstrom, and I'm with ARC Northland as the housing coordinator, and the program I work under is a joint grant between DHS and ARC Minnesota. And what we do is we find housing for people with disabilities that qualify them for either a wavered service or armed services. Um, ARCMIN's uh, legislative coordinator asked me to take a look at my census, so I looked at the first six months of this year. I moved 39 people. 38 of them had arms waivers. Um, one had just an elderly waiver, and four of the people that had arms also had another waiver. So I want to make sure that we are looking at there is a population that needs the housing services. These people are coming out of... Uh, homelessness, um, drug treatment, and you often don't have anything more than the shirts on their back. And one, I'm one of the accesses they have, where they can get some other support through Salvation Army and for just funding just to help them get what they need in a house. That's it. Sometimes the county, but Often not. The county is more likely to say we don't have any funds for that right now than they are to say that they do. Um, the other issue is getting people out of group homes. Um, all four of my sons have worked in group homes. Three of them still do. Uh, one of them started a home group up here with 10 people or 10 houses now. And their populations, I can see where these people have reasons to complain because a lot of the people that are there have been as a condition of parole or probation since there for X no amount of time. And they are not from St. Louis County, they are brought in from out of state. And it is a shadow corrections program where wardens are paid $10 an hour without benefits. And as far as moving people out of group homes, I've had very little success. I've moved one in Itasca County uh, one up on the range and one in Duluth, and that's since February 2010. So we're looking forward to getting some more help with that, but I'm doing all the outreach I can. Like I said, I'm pretty well familiar with the group home industry in this area. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, I don't know how to turn your light on. Maybe Beth can help me. Maybe. Commissioner Tingerthal wants to make a few comments. Mr. Engstrom, a question? Um, could you just say a few words about what are the primary barriers uh, when you're working with someone who is currently in a group home in relocating them into a home in the community? Um, I can't really address that because I haven't had enough clients that were trying to get out of group homes that I've had much experience with it. For the two that I did, one in northern Minnesota and one in Itasca County, it was direct them to where they could get the transition of uh, monies for moving from a group home to independent living. And for the one that was in Duluth, I could not get that money freed up and I'm scheduled to go buy them furniture myself, so. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Rick Hammergren, and that will, he will be followed by Patricia Ann Wallace. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Governor and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Rick Hammergren. I'm a vice president uh, with Opportunity Partners, uh, where I supervise habilitation and vocational training services. Uh, we serve <clears throat> about 1,900 people per year, and um, uh, we're very interested in the provisions and, and, and becoming um, engaged in helping to design the options uh, for the future that will be included in the, uh, in the Olmstead plan. Uh, additionally, and what I'm doing here today is representing two statewide organizations. I'm the president for MORE, M-O-H-R, the Minnesota Organization for Habilitation and Rehabilitation. And I'm a board member of the Minnesota CCD, the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. <clears throat> Whenever a large human services system moves intentionally towards innovation and new vision, great things can happen. 
from my experience, the movement from an institutional model to a community-based model for services, uh, delivering services to people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities was a monumental change that we went through in the 60s and 70s when I was a county social worker. Uh, there was a huge shift in thinking, there was a shift in values, and there was a shift in public funding. However, during that period, there were some less than success stories in that deinstitutional movement. A case in point, uh, the many well-documented failures in Minnesota and across the country, in fact, uh, with misguided service design, especially for people uh, who had mental health issues or a dual diagnosis, a group that I was working particularly with, people who had uh, mental illness and intellectual and developmental disabilities as a dual diagnosis. My concern now as we move into another generation of th this huge um, systems change and as we look at the current evolution is that we need to recognize that many people are served well where they are. Sometimes we don't need to reinvent everything in order to improve it. Maybe we need additional options, but we don't need to abandon those models that are serving people well now. We don't need to abandon current service models in favor of the new trend or beware, please, of the, quote, single solution option or design. Never works very well. Lately, we have heard that in-center work, for example, for people with disabilities is unacceptable and that the new solution is a new innovative idea or design called employment first. Well, people know that any single solution is going to fall short. What we need is a diverse menu of options for employment and for training and community-based supports to find jobs for people that work and that endure that aren't just a simple solution to go out and find a job and a placement, but actually one that provides a solution for the long term. Conversely, in current DTNH programs, we can offer a very diverse service menu, including community orientation, transportation training, uh, providing volunteer options, and much more, including in-center employment options for the people who choose that option, and community-based work options for people for whom that is the best solution. We do that in several different kinds of models. Sometimes it's a three or four person, we call them a support employment team at Opportunity Partners, or they're more commonly called a work enclave, uh, or um, moving people directly towards uh, competitive employment at, um, at minimum wage or better. We can do all of those kind of options under our current licensing and I would submit that we'd like to be able to continue to do so. So as you're continuing your deliberations, please let people who have disabilities and their families and their guardians make real choices about what the best model and design is to meet their needs. Please continue to listen to people who receive services. They know what they need. And they know what works best for them. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Ann Wallace, followed by Nancy Cashman. I, I, um, could somebody help bring the microphone down so that she can speak? Hi, Nancy. You're Nancy. You're Nancy. No, I'm Yvonne. I, fine. Hi. Hi, Patricia. Hi. I, I am a self-advocate and the Duluth REP for People First of Minnesota. And out in the community, I work in at Air Park TTH. We do recycling and sorting and shredding, and we are paid by how many bags we short and fill th this place. Uh, what do you call it? 
Uh, Vice Racer work at Menzlin Wade. Self Menzlin Wade. I would like to get paid by the hour like you get paid by hour. I deserve the same thing. I find my house in the newspaper and I have supported, supported from my team to make it happen. I think that everyone has rights to choose where they live and be happy all kinds of people live in my community. Uh, families, college students, old people, and people like us live together and have potlucks, gathering, and ramen sailing, and that included everybody. The, Umstead friend should make sure that everyone has support, give people a chance to show them that we can do it. Yes, we can. Everybody deserves a chance and everybody learns differently. People just need to be shown how to do things, it can take a while, but they can do it. Everyone has a dreams where they want to live, work, and be happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy Cashman followed by Mark Nelson. Hi. Lieutenant Governor and Cabinet members, uh, my name is Nancy Cashman and I work with for Center City Housing here in the city of Duluth. And we are a low income housing developer and we own and manage permanent supportive housing programs in Duluth, St. Cloud and the city of Rochester. And I think I'm gonna talk about a little about this issue in a little different way than uh, most of the other speakers have been talking because I'm gonna really come from the point of view from the supportive housing model. Um, we currently manage three facilities. We own and manage three facilities that house chronically homeless single men and men, men and women who also happen to be chronically addicted to alcohol. Um, all of them were homeless upon entry and the average length of stay in our three facilities on the streets prior to moving in with us was seven to eight years. Um, these programs happen to use group residential housing funds to operate and so we have some concern about how this is gonna go. Um, in addition to those supportive housing programs, we also have permanent supportive housing options for homeless single men and women, unaccompanied youth, uh, 18 to 21 or 22, and families with children. Most of the residents that we see in these programs have at least one family member who is disabled, and our funding requires that people have a disability to be eligible to live there um, and homeless at the same time. So, uh, so we have folks that have high barriers and very high needs. All of the people who live in our supportive housing programs are homeless upon entry into the housing and most have mental and or chemical health issues and many of which have dual diagnosis. Um, in our experience, homelessness is really not a good support plan or treatment plan for uh, folks with disabilities. Um, and I would guess that that's um, universal. Universally, well, probably not universally thought, but in our opinion, uh, we see it as really not a good option. So our support programs um, and housing programs really enable tenants to live independently and integrated into the communities in which they are housed. All services are voluntary and individuals choose which activities and services they would like to participate in. The, the responsibility is really on us to provide activities and services that, that people like and want to have. Um, it's important, it's permanent, and people can stay as long as they would like to, as long as they uh, follow the rules of a lease, just like anyone else who uh, rents an apartment in the city. 
Uh, we utilize harm reduction principles in all of our programming, and this allows residents the most flexibility in choosing what programs and services and activities are most appropriate for them. The services are designed to identify and address barriers to long-term housing success and stability. This often means helping people look at their untreated mental and chemical health issues. And in the past, many people, in the past, many people have lost their housing because of behaviors associated with their disabilities. Um, our services are, are designed to support people as they go through sort of an episode or a bad time and, and help them deal with the issues and the behaviors and not lose their housing as a result of um, what often happens for folks as they cycle around in their, um, in their illness. Um, we've been very, very successful at this, with this model and at keeping people housed and integrating them into the community and really reconnecting them with families because lots of folks uh, have lost all connectivity to uh, families of origin and children and, and all of that and, and we've been successful at that. So while we are very supportive of the Olmstead plan and really understand the point of it and think it's great, um, we're, we're concerned that the rules could be written in a way that will negatively impact our programming and housing and really most importantly the folks that are living in our facilities. Um, so as you continue your work in developing these rules and plans and all of what you're doing, um, I just think it's really important that you understand how supportive housing works and while we use some of the same funding tools as some of the other programs like group residential and, and foster homes and all of that, we really, we really bring something different to the table and that, um, you know, we're concerned about the, the rule around 25% of the folks because it really have to be if you build a new facility or have a, that only 25% of the units can be for folks with disability and that completely collides with all of the capital funds that are out there, all of the service funds and all the operation funds. So I don't know how we will continue to help people get off the streets if these policies and rules and laws really start to crash into each other. So thank you very much. Yes, um, Commissioner Roy. Can you say collision? Well, so right now, most of our supportive housing funds come from HUD, and HUD requires that you be homeless upon entry and that you have a disability. So for me to build a facility and manage, for example, we're currently developing a 44-unit permanent supportive housing program for very high barrier families with, with children who have had multiple episodes of homelessness. At least one member of the family must have a disability, and they have to be all homeless to be eligible to live in the building. It's not cost effective, to build a facility that only has four or 10 units because then you end up scattering services all over and that the model that we have found to be very successful has been congregate living with people having their own individual apartments but having high intent services and, and providing services in a philosophy that understands the barriers that people have and helping them to maintain housing because what we're finding is that housing is turning out to be um, a, a, a source of reducing medical costs, detox talk costs. It's you know the housing, the health outcomes for children who maintain long periods of housing into the future seriously uh, have a tremendous impact. Um, it also provides us an opportunity. We're providing comprehensive programming for children addressing their mental and, and emotional and social needs early, la, 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 I could go on forever. Sure, Commissioner. Follow-up question. Some of your clients might not be considered very attractive people in terms of their social skills and their impact on the community. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced local ordinances or restrictions that have hampered your ability to develop programming and housing? No. Um, however, Commissioner Dahlberg did speak a little bit to the concentration issue, and so there have been some discussions about where new facilities um, get placed. But we haven't run into any of that yet. But it's always a NIMBY issue, wherever. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Mark Nelson. Lieutenant Governor and uh, Subcabinet, good afternoon. The wind off the lake will come, just wait. <laughs> um, 
you've heard many uh, very helpful comments this afternoon, and so I'm just going to add a, a few brief remarks. I'm the uh, Division Director for Adult Services for St. Louis County Public Health and Human Services, and so uh, I speak in that role here today. Um, as we support the Olmstead initiatives, uh, which do hold much promise, there's an environmental support that uh, I want to suggest that is uh, made note of, and that would be the adult protection system is one of those things that needs to be strengthened in the state of Minnesota. Relative to um, the child protection system, the adult protection services are really uh, funded on, on a fractional level, and yet the need is very substantial, especially as we seek to integrate people, uh, support the integration of people into the community, uh, and as we have an aging population. Uh, vulnerable adults, uh, whether they're categorically vulnerable adults or functionally, uh, so uh, the possibility of physical harm, neglect, and increasingly financial exploitation are issues that we need to have the capacity to uh, address through adult protection. There's some really, ter there's some really terrific uh, work being done, and I know the department has been staffing accordingly now to ramp things up at the uh, uh, VA ju uh, Juvenile Justice Project uh, associated with William Mitchell College in the cities has a, a very robust kind of a think tape, uh, think tank uh, group, so I would uh, encourage the Olmsted Plan Group to consider that as an environmental support for going forward. Uh, I also just have two other comments. Uh, with respect to meaningful choice, there is an issue for a need to look at the availability and the accessibility of desired services throughout the state of Minnesota. There is a concentration of services in particular counties, and uh, so people really don't have a lot of choice in, in many, many counties. And so uh, recently the legislature directed the Department of Human Services to complete a GAPS analysis, which was done in December. And I know staff have that and are working on that, but there's a lot of information that will inform some very healthy next steps that will support meaningful choice. Uh, and then also just one last thing. On page 10, at least page 10 on my sheet, uh, under housing, it talks about uh, where, if I could just read it briefly, that housing is about where people live uh, with their own family, on their own, or with other people. And the goal is that people will choose where they live, with whom, and in what type of housing. And all too frequently, we have seen people who are either living in a home, being introduced to people moving in, they don't have any say about that. And so there's a dignity piece there, nor do people often have a say about where they're going to be going. This is the only option. And so uh, the other part of that would be safety, and that's where from the adult protection side that I come from, that we have found over the last number of years that resident mix is a very important factor to consider over the potential for managing challenging behaviors and informing individual abuse prevention plans that each resident in adult foster care needs to have. So. Uh, keeping uh, that uh, uh, option there for people to choose where they live and who they live with and how we uh, put that together I think is going to be important for dignity of people as well as safety for them and others. So thank you for being here and appreciate your uh, listening. Thank you. Excuse me. Commissioner uh, Roy again has a question. Speaking to that last issue about roommates, basically, and who, who in a contracted house situation, who makes the decision or who screens the current residents and their compatibility with somebody that needs protection that you were referring to? Well, there are like many, many answers to that or many possibilities. It depends on the provider, it depends on the county. It depends on the case managers involved. It depends on if the case managers are from all in one county or multiple counties. Uh, our, my, my, uh, uh, what, what I think is an important better practice as far as a history, at least in St. Louis County, in our developmental disabilities area, we have really made some, I think, gains in developing how you approach that and so people are all involved in that discussion, the case managers, the, the families frequently, and the residents. And then ultimately the provider has to make choices too over if they have the capacity to serve people. So there are some stops that 
that may occur apart from the the uh, person who's wanting to move in or the people that live there, but uh, that's uh, the desirable way to approach it. But uh, it just it uh, it happens that people just will be placed at times. And as much as licensing requires pre-placements, that doesn't always happen. Uh, and in developing individual abuse prevention plans, you need to know something about. Uh, other people in the home in order for a case manager to say yes that individual abuse prevention plan will work for my client so we would like to see a situation where uh, and it's in the the DSPM there's some things that are there already it's a matter of the will to do it uh, really in and maybe I'm being over simplistic but we have seen it you know the, the it has changed somewhat but there are stops and starts uh, but for case managers to work together with the provider uh, to to see about potentials or concerns and are they manageable and how do the residents feel about that so Commissioner are there, Rye. Are there information sharing barriers either in statute between caseworkers regarding people in the same house well there are limits but you have to address safety so under the licensing rule and and there are others who could speak uh, better to it than I here today but uh, uh, you need those it's it's wired into the situation you have to be able to you know if you have a, a you know and I, I don't want to suggest any particular behaviors that need to be managed but if you, you're talking about vuln vulnerable adults and so uh, the the provider as well as the uh, referring parties need to provide enough information because sometimes there's uh, little or no information provided too. So is there a statutory adjustment that's needed? Uh, I'm not sure that there is. I'm looking at Commissioner Jessup. <laughs> different question for a different yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. So. Your comment that sometimes it's the the will to do it. And or taking the time and yeah. So. Commissioner Lindsay had a question too. Help me out with the name. Help me down. I can. Do I have the right? Do I, I have your microphone on? I, Kevin, I can get you the information. It's uh, Kim Dayton's doing it at William Mitchell. There's a successor to the uh, namesake or the person who started it. Yeah. So. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that brings me. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our list of people who have. Who have signed up to speak, but it, I see there's somebody in the back that would like to speak. Yep, please come forward. Just give us your name. I'll be brief because I'm cooking back there. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Lieutenant Governor and panel members. My name is John Hansen. <clears throat> I have owned McCarthy Manor for 27 years. We are officially known as an assisted living home, but earlier we were known as a board and lodging with special services and also a residential care home. For a little history, McCarthy Manor has used caddy waivers since the mid-1990s and elderly waivers before that. The state of Minnesota and St. Louis County should be commended for the early use of waivers as they were at the forefront on both the state and county level, respectively. The use of waivers opened up many options for many consumers and in particular, those with disabilities. As you draft our, our Olmstead plan, I have a couple of concerns. And number one would be uh, how you would define community living settings. There are indications that some factions feel some congregate settings, including housing with services establishments, assisted living homes, et cetera, are not personal homes. I would strongly disagree with that, as would most of the people who currently live in those settings across the state. I would urge the federal, state, and county governments to keep the process for a client to find a home person-centered, and that's some of the language in the Olmstead plan is the uh, person-centered approach. Give clients a choice, let them decide where they wanna live without undue restrictions. Our government and the clients need all options open with a broad range to choose from. The demand for services are great and will only grow as time progresses. Our phone rings steadily and it seems to ring more and more as time goes on. We must be prepared for what is coming and keep all parties engaged. 
uh, as the guy from RSI said earlier, sometimes it feels like providers are a little bit on the outside. And, and uh, uh, number two, my second concern I have is any attempt to separate the housing function from the services function. Everyone agrees the least restrictive setting for everyone is always the goal. People that can live in their own house with services brought in, would, that would be a wonderful, uh, you know, that's what we should all shoot for. But there are a broad range of people who need 24-hour care or monitoring or supervision. Most people who come to us at McCarthy Manor have not been safe or successful in a house or an apartment, but they excel or thrive in our setting. Additionally, in this day of budget cuts and constraints, assisted living homes and uh, housing with service establishments um, with com are, are one of the most cost-effective options out there. My third concern is with any group or government trying to dictate or restrict the physical layout of apartments or rooms. This would include whether they should have, uh, I've seen a lot of different things, including on the federal level, whether they should have kitchens, lockable units, roommates, complete bathrooms, etc. cetera. Uh, many beautiful, beautiful but older historic homes that are, are wonderful options for people would have a difficult time meeting some of these restrictions. And perhaps one possible uh, alternative to that would be some type of grandfather system that would allow some of these older homes that couldn't meet that criteria to continue to exist. And in closing, all my, con in closing, all my concerns can be addressed by remembering one thing. Give consumers lots of choices and let them decide. As you saw from several of the speakers today, uh, you know, they're perfectly capable of making their own decisions, especially with the help of a social worker or a team. Uh, most of what those people, most people have that now in this day and age. Let the market work rather than the government setting all kinds of restrictions and impediments. People are very capable of making choices when given a chance. The current system, although with some flaws, does work like an open market. As assisted living homes or housing with services, we are very aware that any resident can vote with their feet and move out if they so desire. We work extremely hard and really it is our focus to make sure every individual is satisfied with our services. Thank you for the opportunity of allow allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the committee here? Uh, how about the panel members here? Are, is there anybody that would like to make any closing comments or any, uh, any questions or? Dr. Ellinger. All of the comments that people made, it really broadens the discussion and I appreciate the efforts that people make. And as Commissioner Jessen mentioned, this is an issue that all of us in, in the administration are working on. It's not just a DHS issue, it's certainly a, a public health issue, it's a housing issue, it's a transportation issue, it's a corrections issue. Uh, and we're all listening and so really appreciate the time that you've taken to share your comments with us. And education and workforce development, right? <laughs> could, could have gone on and on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would like to add to that, too, and just say th I thank you very much for coming out today. I know that it's a hot day. It hasn't been easy sitting in this room. Uh, I appreciate, though, the fact that you did bring us your ideas. We are listening to you. We do want to incorporate your concerns, so we will be moving forward. I liked, I liked your idea. It was very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you to everybody. And don't forget that you can, if, if uh, you think of some other ideas, you can go to the website. You can add your comments there. So thank you. <laughs>